Coniston Water is the Lake District's third largest lake. It's five miles long, half a mile wide and 180 feet deep. The lake became famous when Donald Campbell attempted to beat his own world water speed record in January 1967. You're past the point of no return from the moment you start. There is no going back. Tragically, Donald Campbell lost his life when the boat lost control. But this tale of tragedy is only part of Coniston's history. It's one of England's most beautiful landscapes, but prior to the Victorian era, few came to visit. In the 1850s, new railway links brought tourism to the lakes. Victorian workers began to get weekends off and were already holidaying in resorts like Blackpool in Lancashire. The Furness Railway operating in the Lake District capitalised on the links already established to Lancashire for ferrying minerals and industrial materials. Now they could carry fare-paying day trippers. From holiday hotspots like Blackpool, they organised day trips touring the lakes, travelling by train, horse-drawn coach and, of course, the steamboat. For around five shillings, holidaymakers could pick from one of many day excursions to the lakes. One of the most popular was the Outer Circle tour around Lake Windermere. These were some of the first all-inclusive tours in the UK. And so the era of mass tourism in the English Lake District was born. Now, the more adventurous would do the inner circle tour and buy their tickets from this ticket office and leave on this very jetty, Lake Bank Jetty on Coniston Water, to get aboard this wonderful steam yacht, the Gondola. Just look at the beautiful lines on this vessel. She was built in 1859, one of the first to be commissioned by the Furness Railway Company for its day trippers. And I'm getting on board. And it wasn't just the aspiring classes taking part in the excursions. Restrictions in travel to Europe during the Napoleonic Wars had established the Lake District as an alternative to the Grand Tour. Wealthy Victorians maintained this tradition. They could now enjoy days out and better still do it in first class style. I'm going to find out more from the boatmaster Bill King. Bill, this is the height of luxury for a steam yacht, it really is. When I was approaching, I was thinking, why is it called gondola? But you can see by the bow section, it's very elegant and it's very extravagant. Just looking around, it's steeped in architectural detail. You've got wonderful sort of Corinthian columns here. I mean, you really do feel like you're on some kind of grand tour, don't you? Yes, and it was designed very much that way, that people who are, who are accustomed to that kind of luxury, perhaps on the great uh, train tours in Europe, yeah. would see the same sort of luxury here. Um, and that's second class? It's second class through there. It would have had slatted wooden seats in there and there would probably been a, a door to segregate the, the two I was going to say, classes. did they ever meet the first? No, because, they, they because were, there were different uh, places to board the boat over the bow for the well-to-do uh, and uh, over the, the, the stern for steerage and uh, the rather steamy sooty end of the boat. Well, I'm keen to look around, so um, w w will you be my tour guide and can I go and see the engine room, the sort of the nuts and bolts of the vessel? Yeah, um, absolutely. Paul, the engineer, is waiting for you down there and looking forward to telling you all about it. OK, and hopefully I can fire up. Absolutely, yes. Load up. Gondola is more than 150 years old and considered to be the oldest yacht in the north. It was in 1980 that she was brought back to her former glory after being left beached and derelict. This is definitely the warmest part of the vessel, that's for sure. It's lovely definitely. in here. But um, we could be literally standing on the footplate of a locomotive. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's a narrow gauge, uh, Fistiniog standardised locomotive boiler. Yeah. Do you have to polish this every, every single day? Every day. Every single yeah, day. Yeah, we polish the brasses every day throughout the boat, not just in here. There's a lot of brass to polish. There is. Do you want Can to polish I... them? Yeah, no, no, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Look, you've kindly given me some gloves. I have. So, can I, can I start to put some You can in? indeed. Just behind you there, so I'm ready for you to put on. Okay. That's looking nice. 
if you put two or three pieces in. Brilliant stuff. We monitor the pressure from these gauges up here. So what you've just put in will now burn, boil the water that's in here. Yeah. And we've now got a, just under 130 pounds of pressure on. So once it's built up enough pressure, enough steam, we can head off? We can indeed, yeah. OK, do you go doo doo, have you got one of those? We can do, we can do that from the top side. Okay. Yeah. And now the world knows we're reversing out of our berth. If you want to just steer for the narrows. OK. You steer, of course, by just aiming the bow flag where you want to go. Yeah. Just right at the old man of Coniston. <laughs> what a view! Travelling at around seven knots, which is about seven to eight miles per hour, we get to experience the tranquility of the lake and this amazing scenery. It's so beautiful, just seeing all the undulating landscape around the water. Well, I don't know, it's bowling me over, really. This is such a privilege to do this. And there, look, we're just approaching Peel Island. Now, that's the inspiration for Arthur Ransom's children's book, Swallows and Amazons, written in the 1930s. This is brilliant. This is the first time I've actually seen Peel Island from the water here. And look, just there, that inlet, that's the secret harbour. And that's all lit up at night now, and all the canoeists are, are camping. <laughs> The Victorian art critic and writer John Ruskin bought a house on the lake here called Brantwood. We're just going by it. We're just approaching its jetty. He was a bit of a celebrity and um, it must have been a, quite a thrill for all the Victorian day trippers to actually bypass his house. And you can see it in the trees just there. It's a lovely view of the house. You can imagine them all trying to spot Ruskin at work in his study, the turreted room, probably cataloguing one of his Turner paintings. <laughs> These stunning views would have been pretty much the same for those Victorians. And what a wonderful escape from those industrial towns. More than 7,000 visitors annually took the Inner Circle trip shortly after it opened in 1865. Towards the turn of the 20th century, that number had trebled to around 22,000 visitors. And today, it still draws in the crowds, taking part in activities in and around it. And let's hope that trip on the gondola, which you can see just disappearing in the distance there, taking in all this magic scenery, will be with us for many more generations to come. It truly is.